Baffled to Fight Better by Oswald Chambers, Chapter 6. The Integrative Plaster, Job Chapter 8. Bildad defers from Eliphaz in his condemnation of Job. Eliphaz declares straight off that Job is wrong, whilst Bildad takes another line, that of asking questions. Neither Eliphaz nor Bildad come anywhere near the reason of Job's suffering. There is an element of the yes, but in us all. And the problems which nearly strangle a man have no meaning for the majority of us. They seem to be extravagant and wild. Bildad did not begin to detect where the real problem of Job's suffering lay. And we must beware in our attitude to people who are suffering that we do not commit the blunder of imagining that our point of view is the only one. Bildad tried the application of the interrogative plaster. He put Job off by asking questions. This is generally the way of a, the man who refuses to face the problems. Number one, the plaintiff of how? Job chapter 5, verse 1 through 2. Bildad is turning attention away from the thing which is making Job speak to his actual words. Why do you talk so much? Bildad says that he does not take the trouble to find out the reason why. He must have exactly the same trick. When we come across a man who is foul-mouthed and blasphemous, there are any number of us ready to reprove him for the one who will try and decipher why he speaks thus. Job is looking for someone who will try and understand that which is behind his talk, but his only finds those who are far removed from his problem. To say that Job lived in the old dispensation and we live in the new, and therefore what Job went through does not apply to us, is an easy artificial shifting of the ground. According to consistent argument, the New Testament saint ought to be legions ahead of the Old Testament saint. But in reality, no characters in the New Testament are superior to those in the Old. There are characteristics which are different, but the problems manifested in the book of Job remain the same to this day. The revelation given through our Lord Jesus Christ of redemption is retrospective in our day, while in the Old Testament it was prospective. The dispensation is different, but the problems remain the same. Job goes down to the heart of the problems that make redemption necessary, whilst Bildad, with his interrogative plaster and pious dealing with the problems, is really shirking the whole thing. Number two, the place of doeth. Job chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. The track of the sincere shirker is indicated in Bildad, and this is always the result of being hit unexpectedly. C.F. John chapter 4, verses 16 through 20. We are all sincere shirkers, more or less. When we find ourselves suddenly discerned, we turn the discernment off to something else for a time. Bildad, in putting these abstractions before Job, is implying that Job's problem is not so difficult to understand, that his suffering is caused by his own wrongdoing, and God's judgment is perfectly right. He is always a trying thing to continue with a man who persists in giving an abstract supposition as a concrete fact. Number three, the philosophy of if. Job chapter five, verses five through six. The implication behind all these questions is, even if you are as wrong as a life has makes out, you are not suffering so much as you imagine, and there is no big problem at the heart of things. God is not unjust, but you are. And this is the reason for it all. When problems are pressing very hard, there is always someone who brings a suggestion of if or but or how.
to take us off the track. If problems can be solved by other men, they are not problems, but simply muddles. When we come to the real, downright problems of life, they have no explicit answer saving by the designer of life. We are exactly where Job was, and we cannot understand his petulance with those who tried to answer him. If the friends had remained dumb and reverent with what they did not understand as they did during the first week, they would have been a great sustaining to Job. And it would also have meant their approach to the place which Job ultimately reached, and they would not have been rebuked by God. The gospel of temperament works very well if you have only some psychic neurology and all you need to speak is a cup of tea. But if you have a real deep complaint, the injunction uh, to cheer up is an insult. What is the use of telling a woman who has lost her husband and sons in the war, World War I, to cheer up and look on the bright side. There is no bright side. It is absolute blackness. And if God cannot come to help her, truly she is in a pitiable condition. It is part of the role of a man to be honest enough to know when he is up against causes like this. The gospel based on preconceived notions is an irritant. Bildad had his creed and his notion of God. Job does not fit into these. Therefore, it is a bad outlook for Job. Bildad, in effect, says, My point of view of God cannot be wrong. Therefore, you must be. Number four, the pose of platitude. Job chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. The line Bildad takes up in these verses is as if a man were to preach to the inmates of a lunatic asylum and tell them it is better to be sane than mad. But in the meantime, they are mad. Bildad denies that Job is facing a problem which had never been faced by his fathers. We are apt to forget that there is always an element in human suffering which was never there before. Tennyson puts it finely. In a memoriam, quote, one writes that our friends remain, that loss is common to the race, and common in a common place, and vacant chaff well meant for grain. The loss is common, would not make my own less bitter, rather more, too common. Never morning war, to evening, but some heart did break, unquote. There is a great deal in both joy and sorrow that is similar in the case of everyone, but there is always one element that is entirely different, and the planetarium evades this. On the human side, the only thing to do with a man who is up against these deeper problems is to remain kindly agnostic. The biggest benediction one man can find in another is not in his words, but that he implies I do not know the answer to your problem. All I can say is that God alone must know. Let us go to him. It would have been much more to the point if their friends had begun to intercede for Job and had said, This is a business for God, not for us. Our creed cannot begin to touch it. But all they did was to take to Chattermangi in telling Job he was wrong. When God emerged, he put his imprint on all that Job had said of him and his disapproval on what his friends had said. If redemption is not the basis of human life and prayer a man's only resource, then we have followed cunning devised fables. <clears throat> During this war, World War I, men have over and over again turned to prayer, not in the extreme of weakness, but in the extreme of limitation which means that they have got beyond the limit of a man, and whenever a man reaches the utmost limit, he unconsciously turns to God. Bildad claims to know exa exactly what Job is, and Eliphaz had claimed the same thing. 
Job was hurt, and these men tried to heal him by platitudes. We were never intended to understand life. Life is that which makes us what we are, but life belongs to God. If I understand a thing and can define it, I am its master. I can understand and define life. Neither can I understand and define God. Therefore, I am a master of neither. Logic and reason are always on the hunt for definition. And anything that cannot be defined is apt to be deified. Rationalism usually defies God and defies life. It will not have anything it cannot define on a rational basis. Forgetting that the things that make up ele elemental human life cannot be defined. There are teachers abroad today who are playing the fool on these elemental lines, declaring that they can give guidance and they succeed in doing a fathomless amount of harm. A man is a criminal for knowing some things. He has no right to know them. And the primal curse of God was on Adam when he ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God intended Adam to know good and evil, but not by eating the fruit of the tree. He was to know good and evil as Jesus Christ knew it, by simple obedience to his Father. None of us by nature knows good and evil in that way. Therefore, when we are born from above, we have to take care of what we deal with reverently, with the elemental things underlying life. The place for the comforter is not the preacher's position, but the position of the comrade who says nothing, but who prays to God about the matter. The biggest thing you can do for those who are suffering is not to talk platitudes, nor to ask questions, but to get into contact with God and the greater works will be done by prayer. John chapter 14, verse 12 through 13. Job's comforters never once prayed for him. They tried to make coin for the enrichment of their own creed out of his suffering. Number five, the point of can. Job chapter 5, verse 11. Bildad uses an argument from nature, consistent to its own illustration. One of the first embarrassments we find in the New Testament is that it is not consistent with its illustration in a strictly logical sense. When we take an illustration, we are apt to run it to death in logical sequence. The Bible never does. Bildad takes an illustration from rushes and flags and applies it to Job, but he is more concerned about being consistent with his illustration than with the fact of Job. An illustration ought to be a window which never calls attention to itself. If we take an illustration from natural history and apply it to the moral and spiritual life of men, we will not be true to facts because the natural law does not work in a spiritual world. In the first place, a law is not anything concrete, but a constructive mental abstraction whereby a human mind explains that which it sees. I will restore to you the years the canker worm hath eaten. This is not a natural law, yet it is what happens in the spiritual world. In the natural world, it is impossible to be made over all over again, but in the spiritual world, this is exactly what Jesus Christ makes possible. As there is a law in the natural world, so there is a law in the spiritual world. That is, there is a way of explaining things, but it is not the same in both worlds. Bill Dad makes the blunder being consistent with his illustration. If you're a logician, you will often gain your point in a debate, and yet... You will, you will be wrong. In disputing with some people, you get the best of it because your minds are, are not clever. But when you get away from your flash of triumph, you feel you have missed the point altogether. You want it on debate, but not in fact. 
we cannot get at the basis of things by dispute. Jesus Christ himself comes off second best every time there is a logical argument, yet you feel that in reality he has come off more than conqueror. Jesus Christ lived in a moral domain of a man, and in a sense, the intellect is no use there at all. Intellect is an instrument and not a guide. Number six, the practice of piousness. Job chapter 5, verses 12 through 22. Bildad is cultivating the margin of his eyesight, so to speak. This is a trick of the piousness that is not based on a relationship to God. Bildad is talking apparently of an abstraction, but he is really criticizing Job all the time. Job is the hypocrite and the fraud. It is not meanness in Bildad that makes him do it, but limitedness. There are replete with, with very thou. Bildad has never seen God, while Job is getting nearer the place where he will see him. All the God Bildad, Bildad has is his creed. If he had known the real God, he would have prayed to him and would have him recognize the facts that were too big for him. Whenever we accept belief in a creed instead of belief in God, we become this peculiar kind of humbug. To imply wrong by his right is the trick of every man who places his creed before his relationship to God. In this war, many a man is lesser or greater degree has come to find the difference between his creed and his God. At first, he imagined that because he had lost his belief in his beliefs, he had backslidden. But later on, he finds that he has gained God. He has come across reality. And if reality is not found in God, then God is not found anywhere. If God is only a creed or a statement of religious belief, then he is not real. But if God is that which the book of Job is bringing to light, all with whom a man gets into personal contact by other ways than intelligence, then any man who touches the reality of things touches God.